To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 5, Yahweh's Investigation, The Garden of Eden. Who among us does not know the story of the Garden of Eden? It is an all-time classic tale featuring truth-telling animals, temptation, nudity, a perplexed deity, petty crime, harsh punishment, due legal process, and the flaming, spinning sword that guards roads. Let's break it all down. Hi, Omri. Hi. So, the Garden of Eden, an awesome chapter. Yes. Loved it. First of all, to me, as I read it more and more and more, especially coming to this podcast, it's an hilarious... Yes. Hilarious. (laughs) Hilarious. It's a comedy. (laughs) It's not a comedy. It's so ridiculous. (laughs) And as I read it in Hebrew, sorry, it's even more ridiculous because the language there wow. again, we talk about the language. Okay, about the language, I counted. The Hebrew version has 335 words. The English version has more than double, 695 words. So among other things that translate uh, texts from Hebrew to English, so automatically English has more words, so you get like 30, 40% more words when you go to English and you lose 30-40% when you go back to Hebrew. But this is more than double. So all the half mm-hmm. and hest, this is not in the text. It's also not ancient English. It's modern English, which is much more complex and bigger in terms of vocabulary because it, it combines two languages, basically, and it's much more advanced which in two years. languages. French and English. Oh, okay. like a, and this is and two, 2000, two, 2000 years earlier. So when we talk about the language, the language back then was much simpler. As far as I know, the most comparable language that I know right now is the Japanese language, mm-hmm. which if you take a conversation between two Japanese people and translate it without any context, only literally okay. the words that they are saying, okay. it's very, very... Uh, It's simple. The communication itself relies upon the context for you to understand. Back then, languages relied more about the cultural understanding, the hidden words, the unsaid words, because the language itself was very simple. I, dog, walk. I saw dog yesterday. It wasn't like, thy dog (laughs) has moveth inside of... Mine garden in thy final blah, 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 fine day of this uh, autumn evening. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Because you are dirt, and to dirt you will return. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. The King James's version came again. We said it uh, time and time again in this podcast. That there's also the fact of traditions of writing it's very important to understand that writing the craft of writing is not only translating your thought into a book or a a note or whatever it's also a craft of forming there's an evolution to it exactly you can't go to number four before you went through one two three you can't have a liberal democracy before you had the middle ages you can't have agriculture before you went to these and these places and had the tools exactly. and had the time. So they, they're just not there and mm-hmm. we have to understand where they are. And we're going to get to the hilarious parts in a second, but there, ha- there are several memorable lines mm-hmm. in the story that we still use in day-to-day in, in conversations modern, yeah. uh, and, and idioms. Exactly. For example, Ayeka. When where are thou? Where, where art thou, <laughs> Romeo? Whatever. Ayeka. <laughs> Where art thou? Exactly. Three, two, one. Ayeka, where are you? Yeah. We still use it as if uh, because we're going to explain later why it's very important, important that yeah. the God asks, where are you? 
So the succinctness in it and the simpleness in it, and we're going to see it all throughout the Bible. Sometimes you have these gems, and also another one, Be'etzev Teldi Banim. In sadness will you give birth, this is one word, boys. Mm-hmm. This is one of the punishments that uh, this exactly. evil uh, deity gives uh, to, uh, to women. Imagine how many things you lose when you're not only translating mm-hmm. a, from a different language, but al- also from a different era and time and, and culture. And culture. And uh, like uh, consciousness. Consciousness. You have no DNA way. even. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from d- DNA. Structures of society, art, landscape, all that you see every single day. Okay. But this is okay, because we're going to talk about this all throughout uh, the podcast. Okay. This is a great story. This is about a lying God who punishes <laughs> the beings that he created. So it started that the, that the snake... Vanachash aya erom, aya arum. So the snake is naked and also mischievous. Mischievous. Arum, devious. Arumi, devious. Okay, so this is still words uh, that we use today. And there, so it starts the first uh, verse, Omri. This is like half a sentence. <laughs> it's like the sentence is not uh, grammatically correct. <laughs> it ends like in the middle. It says, so the snake says to the woman, even though God said you shall not eat from every uh, tree in the garden, that's it. There's no, it's like, it's just, it ends. The sentence ends. Like she yeah. interrupts him, I guess, in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> this is very weird. Maybe it's some kind of um, a performance art, and, and now yeah, it's the term for the, and now it's the cue for the woman to come. <laughs> for the woman to come in. Okay, so basically, he tell, like he tries to get her to eat uh, the fruit, not the apple, the fruit. Okay, of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. She says, "No, God says that if we touch it." or eat from it, we will die. Mm-hmm. And the snake tells the truth. No, you will not die. Because if you eat it, you will be as gods, knowing right from wrong. So this is the, this is the superpower of the gods. And we're going to see later that also they live forever. But mm-hmm. like they don't shoot uh, whatever lightning from their fingers. They don't have like a special hammer or anything like that. They can tell right from wrong. <laughs> incredible i don't think and live forever and be also judge jury and executioner later on in the in the chapter i'm not sure he did the right thing uh, this dt in the story maybe he did the wrong thing i don't know let's talk about it later we talked about it in the previous episode the fact that uh, this is a personalized personalized god completely different from the more logical and uh, cerebral let's say god an amorphous of the other episode of the first creation story yeah and one theme about this story for me that is shouting out of the text Mm -hmm. is the fact that there's a lot of magic here Mm -hmm. and not only magic harry potter magic expelliarmus whatever it's more like magic in terms of you mix stuff by by the way expelliarmus (laughs) this is harry potter's favorite spell so kudos (laughs) on that do's point go on please i learned that from a rap song like God here, Yahweh, let's keep it 100. Yeah. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahuwah. Uh, it depends on how you imagine ancient Israelites' accent. But he creates man not by a word or whatever. He's like, he's forming him like from clay, from materials. And then he sprinkles some kind of magic into those materials. And then when he creates Eve, the woman, he Chava. needs materials from the ribs yes. to create it. Yeah. So there's like, like, a, like a physical uh, understanding that you, that it's not it's again not something out of nothing. Like we talked about, we talked about that distinction in the previous uh, episodes. He has to have something. He cannot just create like okay. So Harry Potter in Hogwarts, they, if they want to have food in the first books, you're like how would, like Dumbledore just claps his hand and then they, uh, creates food. No, somebody prepares the food in the kitchen and he just transfers the food. And that goes to show you that they didn't even imagine nothingness, yes. as we said in previous episodes. Yes. Because then they will say, and God created man. But no, he took earth, he took dirt. Yeah, he blew whatever. Uh, the spirit into those earth. It's like a Geppetto. Like, uh, it's like yes. when you speak, when you argue with uh, true believers, religious people, 
then the first argument, one of the most powerful argument in their minds that they give you is the intelligent uh, clock make you, maker. So this is like some kind of a hint of the, for their way of thinking, their clockmaker is some kind of a high priest magician and they don't imagine him creating something out of nothing. He needs something to create from. Yes. So the snake tells the truth, but how does the snake know that the fruit is not deadly? So this garden, I guess, has been functioning uh, for some time. And this is, again, this is something very non-monotheistic. It's a, it's, it's a fable. Yeah, exactly. It's a fable. It's like the snake is talking. This is something we don't see that in the in rest a of the story. Garden. In a magical garden, there's nothing like that in the rest. Uh, there's in the rest a donkey of the story. talking in some kind of in some place, ah, but other than that, really? no. Okay. Yeah. Because later it becomes more realistic, uh, <laughs> I guess. You could read it as a modern horror sci-fi story, where like Adam is not actually the first man. There have been Adams before. And so it's like Yahweh is building some kind of, uh, of AI or something and does it over and over and over again. And the snake is actually, he wants to help <laughs> this AI and he tells them the truth about the person who created them and what is this garden and that he is a liar. It could also be like the snake is like Morpheus and he's offering Adam and Eve the red pill to open their eyes fi finally to the reality of their lives and of their worlds. So they can escape from the garden. <laughs> Why is it a snake? It's true that snakes are everywhere in every environment slash climate or whatever. But maybe in the desert, they are far more dangerous and devious yeah, because course. there they are. It's an open space yes. and they still can camouflage themselves yes. inside of it. And snakes, there's something very uh, primordial in their face you can uh, yeah. you can show it to a child a snake showing its fangs and it looks evil yes even if you don't know evil or not evil, it looks evil harry potter <laughs> <laughs> voldemort has a snake slytherin is a snake he starts to look like a snake a snake yeah is evil so this is but there it's without traditions it wasn't yes. overused back then <laughs> it was the first snake the first snake so to that point, so my daughter, when she was growing up, she was scared of tigers. Mm. When she saw a picture of a tiger, she, so there's, she, she's never seen a tiger. She will never be in danger of a tiger. What is dangerous here? Cars. This is dangerous. She, doesn't have, she didn't have like the instinct to be scared of these things because she's been programmed so long, to, so, uh, so long ago when you had tigers and you had to, to just be afraid of predators. Yeah, I think it's a predator face with the fangs and the eyes. Because those people didn't see tigers as well. <laughs> the yes. tigers was, were in India. Yes. They saw lions. They saw lions. And they were majestical and regal. Regal, that's a nice word. Unlike snakes, which yes. are slimy. And, which, and, and the word naked, they are without fur. Also poison. This is like, uh, you know, whatever, dubbed, uh, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, like, the, it's like the, women, the, exactly. the women's weapon. This yeah. is like... Oh, yeah, honor, un unhonorable weapon. Unhonorable. Yeah. He just comes in and, and yeah. bites you in the ankle from yeah. behind. Ay, ay, ay. Come and fight, yeah. snake. So he just tells her, you will not eat it. You will be as gods. You will know right from wrong. And she just immediately says, okay. She says, it looks nice. She eats it, she gives it to the man, he eats it, and then it, they open their eyes, they understand that they are naked. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they have like a fig leaf uh, on their, yeah, uh, their whatever, privates. genitals and privates. So just figs. I was like, when I read it in English, I was like, figs, that doesn't sound very English. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many figs were in English, so I look it up. It's just like whatever, in the Middle East, so yeah. in the Mediterranean region. Yeah. This is Turkey, this is Spain, this is Greece. It's like a, we would adhere to some kind of an ancient book that was written in England, and uh, one of the birds there will be an albatross, and we have no idea what mm. they are talking about. <laughs> and that, that would be our reverent uh, <laughs> bird. In yeah. Israel, we worship the albatross. <laughs> and it will look different. <laughs> you, look, yeah. you know what? It's a great point. So like when you read uh, the Lord of the Rings with all the, the English scenery, 
I'm, I'm, I'm reading about it and I don't know if he's describing a hill or is it a valley or, or, or is it a small forest or a, or, or a big forest? Mm -hmm. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. We don't have any of that here. I don't know. To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms.